Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 15661566. Thank you for joining us today as we have part two of Sean O'Toole talking about foreclosure radar and property radar. We've got a lot of data to get to today, continuation from yesterday's episode. And if you skipped yesterday, you can just keep on listening. It's not in any particular order, so it's easy, easy. Uh, you can just go back and grab that episode whenever it's convenient. And be sure to join us for our upcoming Pandemic Investing class. It's just a one-day class. That is at pandemicinvesting.com. We've got a whole bunch of great new data to share with you data, material, how people are reacting to these crazy times in which we live and what that means to your investment strategy. So be sure to go to pandemicinvesting.com and get your low-priced early bird registration. It's online. It's on Zoom. So it's real easy. Go check that out, pandemicinvesting.com, and be sure to join us Gosh, that's in like 11 days. So be sure to uh, get your tickets ASAP and we'll look forward to seeing you there. And here is part two of Sean O'Toole with Foreclosure Radar and Property Radar. You've got some charts and graphs and I, I'd like to dig into those if we could, if you could share your screen and yeah, okay. let's look at, look at some data here. Uh, well, the and, thing uh, we were talking about here a second ago, is the, um, I was running around doing a presentation in 2016 that I think is particularly, uh, you know, interesting given just where we are today. Mm -hmm. And so in 2016, I was basically running around telling folks, look, you know, I, I actually said, I'm going to stop doing economic updates. And I did in 2016, I stopped doing economic updates because nothing was changing, Right. Prices were going up slowly because of a lack of inventory. Sales were flat. You know, just wasn't much interesting happening. And, and I basically said three things, right? One, flat is the new black, right? Things are going to be pretty calm, slight price increases, but pretty calm in the real estate markets until we have a black swan. And Black Swan is, you know, from uh, Nassim Taleb's book. I'm, I'm, and a huge, it, I'm a huge fan of his work. He's great. But it just it, what's interesting is I was calling this a Black Swan when it first hit. And, <laughs> and Taleb was actually on TV. And I saw an interview where he said, this is not a Black Swan. It's a white swan <laughs> for whatever oh. it's worth. Yeah, so, so actually, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because, he, and it's funny he said white swan because Michelle Wucker wrote a book rhino. called The Gray Rhino, <laughs> which was basically to say, you know, that a gray rhino is the obvious dangers we ignore, right? It's mm -hmm. a highly probable, high impact yet neglected threat, right. which we have a lot of, you know, you know, the, the power grid, you know, lots of things that we are not taking care of that we should be taking care of. So yes, I, I totally agree. But back then, the, I don't think her book was out yet, and uh, Taleb was not talking about white swans yet, so we used black swan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, okay, take us through this a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, basically the, the thought here was that, that I thought there would be something that comes up at some point that rocks the boat, right? And I walked through a whole bunch of things from technology and automation to cybersecurity, you know, nuclear war, war right? Terrorist attacks, you can see there in the bottom right corner, this slides from 2016, you'll see a quarantine area. And uh, so that was actually one of the things that I put out, and you know, Bill Gates and lots of other people were talking about the possibility of a pandemic. But it was just one of the things that I said, look, there's, there's things that can happen that are coming up. And but my 
point to the folks in real estate at the time was that, you know, it's not going to be the same as 2008, which we just talked about a little bit, because, you know, Janet Yellen was the Fed chairman at the time, right? And I argued basically that she had a shrink ray and would use it to turn the black swan into the, uh, I always forget the name of the uh, baby swan. It's a weird, it's a different, completely not oh, anything you'd expect. I don't know that. But yes, yeah. the Fed the Fed can basically change anything, right? It, you know, it's magical. You can just create money or ease the money supply or ease the credit supply in some way. And it just changes everything. You know, what a lot of these doom and gloomers that have been predicting the end of the world for decades, and it just never happens, they're just constantly wrong. They sort of act like things happen in a vacuum. Like, okay, well, the economy is going to do this, that, and the other thing, but they forget that there are all these response mechanisms, you know, and, uh, and seems pretty ridiculous a lot of times. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, there are all these response mechanisms. And, you know, and, and what's interesting is we've been in this boom bust cycle really since, you know, 99, the dot com, right? I was, I was sure. a tech guy in Silicon Valley and definitely experienced the dot com bubble. And we rescued that really with Fed policy, low interest rates that blew up a housing bubble, right? And then we rescued that, you know, again, by kind of creating a strong stock market and other things, right? And so we keep having these, these boom bust cycles. There's winners and losers. You kind of mentioned earlier that it's not evenly distributed. You know, the wealth gap is growing, I think, as a direct result of the way we're dealing with these crises. Oh, definitely, um, because because all the banksters just keep getting richer every time there's a crisis, and everybody else gets their money inflated away. You know, so you're you're absolutely right. You know, the people close to the money always benefit, and everybody else gets the scraps. And sometimes those scraps actually make things worse, not better, at least in the long run. Yeah, and no question, right? And but when you have these Fed responses, right, that we're just not very good. The concept of let's pump money back into the economy, right? So we're having COVID itself is going to cause a deflation, right? And so you pump money out there, which causes inflate, should cause inflation. Right. But to the degree that it offsets inflation, it's just reflation and gets you back to flat, right? So, you know, that's kind of the goal with these, these policies is to get us back to where we were. The problem is we're not very good at handing out that money, as we saw with PPP, as we saw with the unemployment insurance, right? So we put out unemployment insurance, and then people don't want to go back to work, and small businesses can't reopen because people are making more money staying home. Right. Or, you know, PPP, where you get people that don't need it getting it and buying Ferraris, and other people who do need it can't get it because the stars aren't aligned for them. Sure. We're just not very good at distributing the money. And that creates these, this unequal divide oh, of where it goes. Absolutely. Um, so where it goes is- for sure is asset prices, right. which is why housing right now is not surprising me at all. That it's booming and prices are increasing, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So where it always goes, that was a really key line that you said, where it always goes, meaning the inflation always goes, is it goes to asset price inflation versus consumer inflation. Now, right. we've definitely seen, you know, a, a decent share of consumer inflation recently with grocery prices at a 50-year high. But if, you know, if you go with the, the core rate of, of inflation, then they're going to exclude food and energy. So, you know, <laughs> they're not even counting that. Uh, but energy has been pretty deflationary lately. So we'll see. But do you think asset prices will continue to soar? I mean, that seems to be the trend right now, but is that going to continue? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's just everything I watch there. You see you have some art behind you, art, cars. Classic uh, cars, least, you mean? Yes, like, yes, classic cars, single family real estate, like lots of lots of things like that are all doing very well right now, right? Because basically what you have is you're printing more money, right? The money becomes worth less. And so you right. want to have tangible things so that you're not losing, you know, the dollar's losing value. So, right. you know, so, so this is really predictable. And this is kind of what I was saying back in 2016. We know what's going to happen, right? We're going to have a crisis. The Fed's going to come in. They're going to print. And we're going to see asset price inflation. Now, that's not quite that easy, though, because, right, like, okay, I'm going all in in real estate in San Francisco, and then it's a pandemic, 
right? Or nobody's working from home and I went all in on office, right? And this is where diversification is still important because you don't know what that crisis is going to look like. Did they just new coast? Did they, you know, whatever, right? Um, This kind of boom bust crisis cycle, I think is our future as long as we're the world's reserve currency. And and, and I think there'll be another one. Okay, so why does being what was does uh, having the re, the dollar being the reserve currency have to do with it? Why does that make us more boom and busty than another economy that's not the reserve currency? We have a lot more flexibility in our ability to print money, right, and still buy goods cheaply, right? Yeah. So we basically export inflation, we put that burden on take it on ourselves. We could talk about the impacts that has on the world and, and the view of the world of us and the rest, but it, it has it's a lot not, of- It's not very fair, for sure. Right. Yeah. It's not very fair. So as long as we have that power, right, and this is the whole modern monetary theory, which I think both parties are embracing, frankly, whether they think they are or not. Right, um, right. It basically says we can print all the money we want to print and do whatever we want. And, you know, that is the the cycle I expect to continue to happen until we lose that world's reserve currency status. Now, we're a big enough country. We import a lot of stuff. We're dependent on other folks. We might have to play by at that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, the MMT thing, modern monetary theory thing, that seems to actually you know, really hold true. And I and I think modern monetary theory is largely a fantasy, okay? You know, that you can just spend as much as you want and have no consequences ever, right? <laughs> you know, that's a, well, obviously- to be, a, to be fair, MMP actually says there is a consequence that when you start having high inflation, you pull inflation into control with high taxes. And yeah. then that, once you get inflation down, you lower taxes. And that yeah. you use taxes as the control to control the economy rather than interest rates. Right. So the thing, though, is that the IRS is the biggest taxing agency on earth, and you have to pay the IRS in their currency of choice, which is dollars. And the U.S. is, it's a huge debtor. Okay, I get it. But it's also a huge lender. Okay, and all of those loans have to be repaid in dollars. And that strengthens the dollar. It keeps, it puts a floor onto how weak it can get no matter how much money we create. That's, Which is why we can a, kind of print like crazy like we are. Yeah. I know. It's it's a pretty beautiful concept for the U.S. It's not very fair to everybody else, but the U.S. is obviously in the bully pulpit, for, you know, for better or worse on that deal. Just Other things that I think a lot of people don't realize, like a lot of yeah. people think that the trade deficit's a bad thing. But mm-hmm. what the trade deficit really is, is we import goods, we export dollars. But they can't spend those dollars other than to reinvest it in our debt, which drives our interest rates lower. I know. So our running a big trade deficit is part of why we have such low interest rates. Yeah. So, you know, it's all this stuff is like a lot of people just don't understand how intertwined it is. It's super interconnected. Absolutely. And the other thing the trade deficit shows you is it shows you how much lifestyle benefit Americans are getting at the expense of somebody else. Like, you know, this this whole trade war is, I don't know, it's almost funny to look at. I hate how the media characterizes it in the sense that they use it to bash Trump. It's really a trade negotiation. And he is right about some things, but all in all, the U.S. is definitely getting a good deal just because of its lucky position in the world, largely. But, you know, could, I mean, is it even plausible that we would ever lose the reserve currency benefit? I mean, I can't see that happening in decades, at least. Well, you know, so this is where, you know, I think we have to be a little careful with how anti-trade and anti-trade deficit we go, right? Because, we were such an important trading partner for China for so many places that as we take an anti-trade position or try to even bring stuff back here, we become less important as a reserve currency. And it's easier for other countries to go, you know, forget it. Like there's a lot of those conversations around oil where people are saying, hey, let's trade in something else. So I think we have to be careful what we wish for there, that we are such a big consumer of goods and that we import so much and have such a big trade deficit is part of how we get to maintain a world's reserve currency. China's a lot less dependent on us now than they were five years ago, 10 years ago. And at some point that breaks where they go, you know what, we don't care anymore. Yeah. And Russia goes, you know what, we don't care anymore. 
Yeah, well, that's the theory that Peter Schiff has been espousing for almost 20 years, I think, this decoupling idea, which has been gloriously wrong, in, you know, so far. And yes, it China... Help you until it isn't, right? <laughs> fair, fair enough, fair enough. I totally hear you. You know, China is creating its own middle class, but it's a, been a long slog, even though they've done it faster than anybody. It's still, they got a long, long way to go to get to where... a lot of problems, a lot of issues. Gotta, and, and the thing that's going to hit China at the time when they're just maybe hitting that power curve of creating their own consumer class is their demographic problem that is coming with a vengeance because of the one child policy. So, uh, you know, that's are, a, what they are doing and that what we should be doing, right. Is they're investing in infrastructure. They're investing in yeah. a lot of things, you know, to the point where you have ghost cities that they're building ahead of yeah. any need yeah. for, but which, you know, you can debate the, the validity of that, right, for sure. But it, there's still a major investment going on. And we've gotten soft. We're not investing. We're not rebuilding our infrastructure. We're turning off power in California because the power grid can no longer support the power needs of the densest, you know, state in the, uh, in the uh, union. Oh, it's it's truly depressing in a lot of ways, Sean, because you look at like, you know, I remember last time I was in San Francisco last year and I, you know, I've been there a million times, but I, I went to look at the Golden Gate Bridge with my girlfriend, right? And I thought, when is when are we ever going to have like a great project like this again in, in the U.S.? You know, there's been no, uh, well, the World Trade Center, they finally rebuilt it, took forever. And I don't know if it's that incredible. Frankly, it's not the tallest building in the world. It doesn't hold any records that I can think of. You know, we haven't been to the moon again. Uh, you know, I, I mean, my little you know, town's space a fa programs. famous railroad town, and you know, you can walk some of the railroad tracks around here, and you look at what they did yeah. at the time they did it, and it is truly unbelievable. Impressive. Yeah, and we're, we're not doing anything like that anymore. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But hey, um, let's circle back to get a more granular before we wrap it up, if we could, okay. and talk about, you know, your company is Property Radar. So talk to us about some of the stuff that you guys are researching and, you know, maybe any surprising things that people should know about real estate investing and markets. I mean, we've alluded to that. We talked about people leaving or not leaving certain jurisdictions. Uh, yeah. But tell us what um, you're working on. Wow. So much there. Uh, so we've a couple things. We started off in the foreclosure space and we still have, you know, I, I think the best foreclosure service out there. And, um, but we expanded in 2013 to cover all properties, not just those in foreclosures. And originally we're really used as like a property information due diligence service. Most of our customers use this today on the real estate investing side to acquire, find properties to buy um, off market properties. And realtors look for off market properties as well. And then we have like solar and folks like that that use this to find property owners to market to. So that's, that's really, you know, we've, We've kind of went from marketing information to like, I mean, uh, property information to marketing audience creation. And, uh, but we still do dive in and do uh, some analytics. We tend to do it at a, at the, at a lower level now. So for example, there's a, a, a Senate bill in California that's changing some of the foreclosure laws. And, you know, they base this on the idea that there was a lot of vacant homes as a result of foreclosure, but they used a study from the St. Louis Fed, I think, that was, I'm not going to remember, but, but basically it was a different place on the East Coast where there was such a glut of homes, they ultimately had to bulldoze homes because it just wasn't people to buy them. And they're using that logic in California to say, you know, we need to change the foreclosure rules or we're going to have a bunch of vacant homes. And it's just, it was never a problem. Here. And we'll dive in and get that data and, and say, okay, look, on average, homes that were purchased by investors were flipped in 154 days. And if you think about that, that includes eviction and rehab and marketing and the sales and all those different steps it took banks 278 days. So we'll dive into things like that. Or right now we're doing a lot of looking at the iBuyers, right? Open door is going public. And so we're looking at what their activity is. How long does it take a deal? What's the difference between what they buy things for and what they sell them for? So lots of, you know, lots of really good stuff like that. But 
you know, everybody's like, what's going on in real estate? And I've kind of stopped answering that question because real estate is not one market in the U.S. It's hundreds yeah, of markets. Yeah. Well, it's so, about four, it's 400 MSAs almost, right? Metropolitan right. Statistical Areas, I think 392 or something like that, if I remember correctly. And it's over 3,000, and it's over 3,000 counties. Okay. 144. <laughs> yeah. See there, there he goes, folks. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> um, but, but even that isn't granular enough with right. 3,144 or whatever you said. Uh, well, you counties, take- a county is way t- too big. I mean, you know, you know, you got to go, even a city's way too big, even a neighbor. I mean, you know, even a zip code's way too big, right? right. I, I don't know how many zip codes there Real are. Real estate's but- local. For it's sure. very, it's hyper local, hyper local, yeah. right? So, so now I answer the question when it's hyper local. Okay, what next? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. yeah, what what next? You know, I, and I do think you know that's that's. Uh, so, if what's next for us is we are going national, right? So, mm-hmm. our, our our company's been in five states. We're going to be in all fifty states, and uh, we've we've lo- been loading all that data for the last two years. Super excited about it over a billion transaction documents, et cetera. So for the first time, we'll be able to start really doing that comparison, not just in the five states, Arizona, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, and California, but for the whole nation. And we're, we're just diving into that now. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. So maybe we'll close with this, Sean, but iBuyers, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I'm wondering how significant th- their impact will be on the marketplace. And, you know, a lot of these companies, I mean, Zillow's doing it, o- Open Door. There are others, of course, but these these eye buyers that'll buy properties sight unseen, they'll give people instant offers. In some ways, this is really interesting because it makes the real estate market a lot more frictionless. And that's a market that's always had a pretty high degree of friction. You got to get your house ready for the market. You got to deal with showings, hire a realtor, um, you know, deal with negotiation and escrow length and, and the deal falls through and you got to go do it again. And uh, then you got to buy a house and you're displaced and maybe you make a contingent offer. Like that's complicated. And when I was in the resale business uh, for many years before, doing the investor side of the business. I mean, that's a lot of juggling, right? No question. And all that juggling has created a huge opportunity for us on the investor side to come in and solve that problem for folks, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess Open Door is just doing that at a larger scale, right? And on much lower margins, potentially. Certainly, they're doing it on much lower margins so far, right? They're, you know, some of these things, they're, they're selling for less than they bought them for, that's, um, I wanted to get there. So go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, as we dive in and we look at that, there's definitely, and you see different results. So we talk a lot about iBuyers in 2019, 60,000 homes, $8.7 billion, 0.5%, one half of one market share, right? right. So still, it, still it really very small impact, right? Yeah. It's a very small impact, unless you live in Phoenix, and I think it's like 5% somewhere okay. in there, right? Yeah. We talk about Wall Street domination, trying to come in and, and take over all this stuff. You know, and here's their pitch, right? This is an actual letter that one of our clients got for their home with, you know, estimated offer range. So you said, you know, they make an offer sight unseen. That was kind of the pitch, but that's not what's actually happening. On the ground, it's kind of, you get this kind of range estimate and uh, they ask you to upload photos and other things and then maybe they'll fine tune it, but you don't really get your final deal until they've inspected the property. Uh So I just did it myself with Zillow for my home because, you know, I'm thinking about moving. So I I thought their offer sucked. I mean, it was not (laughs) impressive. So I, I, I told them, I said, your offer's terrible. Don't waste my time. But what I was getting at is you were talking about how maybe it was open door specifically or just iBuyers in general, how they're selling the properties for less than they buy them for. And this is the dysfunction of all these overfunded tech companies, right? They do all these dysfunctional market distorting things. Like they'll do deals that don't make sense just to make the machine go. It's like a, a really irrational proof of concept. You, you know, you're in tech, so you know the tech market is dysfunctional. I mean, I think it is. Right. So we looked at 371 deals from uh, Opendoor and their average. And, and, you know, profit's tough here because 
you know, we have to take a guess at how much they spent fixing up the house, right? Yeah. So yeah. if they spent more than we think, then the, it was worse, right? Like, so their average deal though is maybe 7,500 bucks of profit on the deal itself. Now they may make money elsewhere in the transaction with like referring mortgage or title or other things like that. But, you know, very little in the deal it's, uh, itself. That was Sacramento. So here's just an so, example. So was of, the, what's the upshot of that deal though, that study you did? Did they lose money on the deals you think, or did they break even or make money? Certainly with the cost of operating Open Door, they are losing a lot of money, right? Okay. Is there a business making 7,500 bucks a house with the average price of $380,000? I think that's a tough business model period, especially with market risk, like, you know, that, that can happen and markets go down in value and the rest, $7,500 is not much margin at all. So yeah, it's certainly not profitable in and of itself. Can they add on enough extra services? Just kind of the pitch, right? Like, oh, we'll make them the mortgage and we'll get the fees on that. And we'll do the title insurance. We'll get the fees on that. We'll do all these other ancillary things. And, and maybe we get a percentage of the inspections or, you know, whatever. Yeah. That the whole thing in total starts to make sense. It, it's possible, right? Like mm -hmm. our big, our big uh, foreclosure investors uh, back in the 09, 13 days, right? Some of the biggest ones started to do that vertical integration where they had their own real estate offices, even their own HVAC companies and repair companies. And that, that allowed them to work on slimmer margins on the actual deal itself. But, you know, it's a, it's a tough business. Uh, you know, and it's a crazy valuation. So, um, you know, here's an example of a house, right? Like they're repainting the existing cabinets they're putting in really cheap flooring. Mm -hmm. This one actually got granite. We see some others where they don't even do that. So right. we like to look at like kind of the, the after pictures when they get listed. Yeah. Very little repairs. It feels like, I don't know if you remember the REO rehab companies. It's more like those companies coming in versus the local investors do a much better job rehabbing yeah. properties and bringing those values up and increasing the values in neighborhoods. So yeah, you know, I agree. This one they purchased for five thirty three, and it's listed for five thirty two in in July. And I think it's sold for that. Oh, wow, that's yeah. You can't make money on that. <laughs> that's that's something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. All right. Well, good stuff, Sean. Wrap it up for us, and thank you for being on again. It, it was great to have you after all these years. Have you? Ah, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So the website is propertyradar.com. Definitely, please come check us out at, at propertyradar.com. And uh, you can reach me on, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Sean at propertyradar.com. It's, it's that simple. And we'd love to hear from you and the companies on all of those as well. Sean O'Toole, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Yeah.